Hello, hello. Welcome to Be Bold America. I'm your host, Jill Cody, and I'm joined today by Mike Clancy, who will be my guest co-host and who is a frequent lecturer on climate change and currently serves as chair of the Monterey County Chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Mike also is an oceanographer, meteorologist, and recipient of the Navy's highest civilian award, the Distinguished Civilian Service Award, signed by the Secretary of the Navy. Hi, Mike. Thank you for joining me today as guest co-host. Welcome to Be Bold America. Well, thanks, Jill. I'm I'm really thrilled to be here. I've been a big fan of your show uh, for years. I watch it all. Thank you. I listen to it all the time. And I'm just totally thrilled to be a co-host with you today. Well, I'm thrilled to have you and have you in the studio, too. That is what's nice. Today, our program is... Are humans a cancer on the planet? What is Homo ecophagus? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but we'll find out. Well, it is a new term our upcoming interview guest coined to explain the man who devours the ecosystem. Over the course of our evolution, we humans have evolved cultures and adaptations that have now become malignant and that our, and that our human species at the global level has all the major characteristics of a malignant neoplasm, converting all plant, animal, organic, and inorganic material into human biomass or its adaptive adjuncts and support systems. This process is incompatible with continued survival of the human species and most other species on the planet as well. We have big things to do. Our guest today is Dr. Warren Hearn, who is the author of Homo Ecophagus, A Deep Diagnosis to Save the Earth. Dr. Hearn is a practicing physician in Boulder, Colorado, where is also on the anthropology faculty at the University of Colorado. In addition to his medical degree, Dr. Hearn holds a Master's of Public Health degree and holds a Ph.D. in Epidemiology. His clinical epidemiological research has been published widely in scientific and medical journals including bioscience and population studies. His public advocacy of reproductive rights has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, CBS 60 Minutes, and other prominent venues. Dr. Hearn, welcome to Be Bold America. Jill, thank you for your invitation. It's an honor to be on your program, and I appreciate your excellent and detailed uh, introduction. Let me just uh, tell you that the the correct pronunciation of my book, as far as I'm concerned, is homo ecophagus. Ecophagus. Uh, meaning as, e- ecophagus, as in economy, ecology, etc. Uh, ecos uh, meaning, oikos meaning the, the Greek word for home. And uh, we're destroying our home. So I think that uh, it's uh, not obvious how to pronounce that, but that's uh, the pronunciation I give it. And I think that you, your introduction was correct. Well, thank you. It is an honor to have you. Uh, what an amazing life you've had. And thank you for teaching me uh, Homo ecophagus. I will do my best to keep saying it correctly. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Hearn, the first part of your book gives a detailed and complete discussion of your early years and how you came to the conclusions presented in the book. It certainly demonstrates that you've had an incredibly productive and interesting life. How did you recall all this information in detail? Did you keep a diary or journal? Uh, no, I haven't kept a diary. Unfortunately, I wish I had. I, I, when I'm working in the Amazon, I keep a daily journal, a very short, a, f- a few notes. But I generally uh, haven't uh, kept a diary. I think that I, I can uh, remember a lot of things pretty clearly. Uh, once in a while, I find something that I discover that I had forgotten. But anyway, it's um, it, a lot of these experiences that I describe in the book are quite vivid and unforgettable. Ah, so, that's why. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're in your memory banks. Yeah. So how did you come up with the term uh, homo acophagus? And since it is, it is the title of your book, tell us what it means in a little more detail than what I just said okay. in the opening. Okay. Uh, in the first place, let's go back... Um, I start out in the book talking about one of my experiences when I was a 14-year-old grave, grave digger in, in Colorado, uh, standing on a hill looking out on the north toward Denver and seeing the brown cloud. And I, of course, didn't, I didn't know what it was. It looked very abnormal to me. But I learned to learn that this is photochemical smog. And I, and I, you know, 20 years later, I was uh, 
uh, looking at it out from the Denver Museum of Natural History uh, while I was waiting for a meeting to start, and I could see this time I understood that it was photochemical smog. And this was an example of air pollution in the world, um, and it particularly happened to be in, in the city where near where I grew up uh, in Denver. Um, and anyway, uh, you know, fast forward to uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the the time in the in the 60s. I had just come back from Brazil. Where I was a Peace Corps physician. I'd worked in various parts of Latin America, and I'd seen a lot of changes in the environment, particularly in the Peruvian Amazon, but also seen many changes in Colorado. And uh, and so uh, I was studying public health in North Carolina, and uh, and I describe how I I'm I'm studying certain uh, cl- and certain classes such as uh, urban geography, but I'm also I have a, a an anthropology seminar in what we call cultural ecology: how do people adapt and use the environment they're in, how does their culture help them do that? And so that's the general theme. And so this book really is about cultural ecology, you can say. Uh, and anyway, uh, there were several lectures that uh, were really quite important to me uh, as I was thinking about this, and I was also comparing, looking at the images in some of my urban geography books that were uh, high-contrast images of cities over time, such as Baltimore, Chicago, London, etc., and I looked at these images. You know, I'm a physician, so I'm trained in pathology. And these images looked uh, exactly like cancer. Uh, there was no, no no doubt that this was exactly a malignant-looking lesion. And uh, then I heard a lecture by the great uh, Scottish uh, ecologist Ian McCarg, who quoted uh, Lauren Isley, an anthropologist who said uh, as he was flying over the country, uh, what if someone from outer space came and looked at the surface of the Earth and said it looks like it has some kind of a disease? And I'd already been thinking about what a a, a dangerous process we were in. This was back in 1968, okay, 69. And um, uh, and so uh, the, the the idea struck me, okay, uh, if we're a disease, what kind of disease are we? What's the model? If you have infectious disease, you know, metabolic disease, nutritional disease, uh, you, you have uh, parasitic disease, and then you have neoplastic disease. Okay, neoplastic diseases are either benign or malignant. If they're benign, they don't kill you unless they happen to be in the wrong place, like in your brain. Uh, or if it's malignant, then it has certain characteristics. And I remembered from my pathology courses in medical school, there are four major characteristics of a cancer, at least we spoke about in those days, uh, rapid uncontrolled growth, uh, invasion and destruction of adjacent normal tissues, substitute ecosystem for a tissue, um, metastasis, which means different uh, distant colonization, which is what human beings have been doing for hundreds of thousands of years, and uh, de-differentiation, which means that the original t- tissue, it doesn't uh, look like the original tissue anymore. It just looks like cancer. And the cells no longer look like the original cells from the original tissue. They look just like cancer cells. That's all they look like. And so uh, that, that, that takes a little more translation, which I, I get to in my book. But I, and anyway, I was struck by this idea. I was horrified by it. All I could do was sit and think about it for several days and think what the implications were. And think that you know nobody's going to believe me. This doesn't sound reasonable. How? Why would anybody hear what I have to say about this? Anyway, so that's back in the '60s. Okay. Anyway, I started following this, and uh, I kept finding more and more information. And I discovered that other people had thought about this. Some of them quite, quite lucidly, uh, but they didn't really take it very seriously. And uh, but I began to see that this made a lot of sense and uh, that uh, it had very profound and horrifying implications for the future. Well, uh, I went on from there, and I began finding more and more information uh, about this subject and uh, the different components of it and putting it together. And I began publishing papers uh, back in 1990 about it. And uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the first paper that I published on it was called why are there so many of us? Description and diagnosis of a planetary ecopathological process. And uh, then that was published in the journal Population and Environment. I went on to publish another one uh, in Bioscience, Is the Human Species, Is Human Culture, Carcinogenic for Uncontrolled Population Growth and Ecological Destruction. And then I published another paper uh, 
on uh, how many times has the human population doubled, comparisons with cancer. It turns out the mathematics of cancer are exactly the mathematics of human population growth, which is very ominous. And then finally, uh, I, I, I went back to my original comparison of uh, look at the way cities look uh, in, in high contrast and images and their outlines. And uh, so I did another paper uh, uh, that's called Urban Malignancy, uh, the similarities in the fractal dimensions of urban morph- morphology and malignant neoplasm. A fractal geometry is a way of studying irregular shapes. Anyway, so that's sort of the... The sort of basis and inter- inter- uh, introduction to this idea, and then I was invited to write this book, so I did. Wow. Well, Mike, you have a question for our guest? Yes, I do. First of all, let me say I'm just so thrilled, uh, Dr. Hearn, to be uh, talking with you. I'm very impressed by um, all the things you've done in your life. It's really been amazing. You know, um, sometimes when I give my climate presentations, um, climate change deniers will refer back to the book, The Population Bomb. And note that the dire predictions it made back in 1968 did not happen. What I tell them is that half of the prediction made by the book, that population would continue to grow exponentially, did come to pass. What the book failed to anticipate was the green revolution in agriculture that allowed global food production to keep up with global population. But I also tell them that there is a limit to what global agriculture can produce and that we are very close to that limit now, not to mention the fact that global food production from the oceans is also pretty much at the limit. Yes. What's your perspective on that? Well, first of all, um, I heard about the population bomb back in the 60s, but I really didn't read it for a long time. I, you know, I saw Paul Ehrlich on the tube, and I, I said, yeah, he's right about this, and I kept learning about it. Uh, eventually, I, I uh, got around to reading it, and it was really quite an extraordinary book. And in the process, I got to know Paul Ehrlich. We were on a platform in a program together in 1990, and uh, he's become a good friend. And uh, I, I went to visit him and his wife just a couple months ago and uh, got him to sign my original copy of it. Anyway, uh, but, uh, but you know, Paul was, was, was really right about the whole issue, as you say, of the population explosion, which is another book that the, he and his wife did. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, obviously we can look back at Malthus, who talked about this at the uh, beginning of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, he got a few things wrong, but he was still really right about some of the main points. So I think that what I'm trying to do with my book is instead of having just a list of horribles, here are all the horrible things that are happening, the question is, why is this happening? What is the dynamic relationship between these these events? What does it mean? And what I've come up with, then, is the diagnosis that Jill talked about, that the human species now has all of the major major characteristics of a malignant process, and it's a lot more than the four that I learned about in medical school. And so this is a very uh, ominous, um, and this is a diagnosis. It's not... It is not an, an, an analogy. Nobody ever died from an analogy. Uh, this is a diagnosis, and the prognosis is we're going to make ourselves extinct. And that happens to be one of the quotes from our, our son, who was uh, 10 years old when he said this. Um, but I think that... Um, the uh, the the I think that there was a very important uh, impact of the Ehrlich's book um, that draw attention to this problem. I mean, the world population was half what it is now, and when the, that book came out, and things have continued. So you're right. The agricultural revolution, the green revolution, has made it possible for this population explosion to continue. But there is a limit. There's a limit to, to uh, ecological uh, constraints. And uh, you, of course, as a scientist and meteorologist, know this very well. Um, but I think that most people are not really aware that uh, this kind of uncontrolled growth cannot continue. In population biology, you have a curve that describes a very rapid increase of uh, of a population of a particular species, it gets to a point that it collapses. And that's, we're at the top of the curve, somewhere in there. Oh, my. Well, I know Mike has a follow-up question, but it's time for a break. You are well, listening okay. to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM, Many Voices, One Station. Listen globally online from the ksqd.org website. Our topic today asks, Are Humans a Cancer on the Planet? And our guest is Dr. Warren Hearn, who created a new term, homo ecophagus. 
I will create a new term, homo ecophagus, to describe humankind's devastation of the planet and who is the author of Homo Ecophagus, A Deep Diagnosis to Save the Earth. I am privileged to be with my guest co-host, Mike Clancy, who is a frequent lecturer on climate change and currently serves as chair of the Monterey County chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm your host, Jill Cody. This is Deborah Sloss, host of the State of Mind radio show and podcast. If you've enjoyed our State of Mind shows or any of our other informative talk shows, or maybe our diverse and in-depth music shows, we urge you to support local community radio by making a donation to K-Squid and becoming a member of our Squid Squad. This is radio made up of people just like you and me, volunteering our time and energy to create something special, something locally oriented, and something that speaks to you, our listener. So please help us keep the power on, our microphones and headsets working, our discs spinning, and our tower broadcasting. Your donation, large or small, really does make all that happen. To donate today or any time during our fund drive, just call 831-900-5773 or go to the donate page on our website at ksqd.org forward slash donate. And together, we'll keep working to bring the best of Santa Cruz County over the airwaves right to you. We're back. Would you like a friend to hear this interview asking, are humans a cancer on the planet? As you probably have heard by now, Be Bold America is available as a podcast and pushed out to 10 podcast platforms and YouTube. Subscribe for free from your favorite platforms such as Apple, Google, and Spotify. Now, Mike, back to you for your follow-up question. Yes, uh, Dr. Hearn. What are the roles of greed and short-term versus long-term thinking in explaining the manner in which human civilization has proceeded in exploiting and degrading the natural world? For example, if you only care about the Earth over your own lifetime, don't care about the fate of future generations, and are interested only in bettering your own standard of living, then you will approach the world and your place in it very differently than someone who takes a long-term view and cares about the future of civilization. What's your view on this? Well, I think that uh, these are obviously elements in the dynamics of what's going on. Uh, there are lots and lots of motives that people have for doing these things. I think that, uh, and there's always a, a, a desire, uh, an impulse, a look to for the, who's at fault here, who's at blame. I think that uh, if you're a human being, you really can't help being part of the problem. And that's been true for thousands of years. And so I think that... Um, um, what I'm trying to look at, and the fact that what we do is create cultural adaptations that allow us to survive and which have helped us survive and, in fact, become the dominant organism on the, on the planet. Um, and, uh, but uh, if you can say, well, uh, so we have a choice. Shall we drill for oil in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and destroy that ecosystem, or do we follow somebody else's advice? to say, well, no, let's uh, increase the efficiency of automobiles, or better yet, let's make automobiles that don't use fossil fuels, or even better, let's use bicycles, uh, which give people good, good exercise that they need, and uh, uh, instead of riding around cars. So, so I mean, there, there are d different kinds of adaptations. And what we're up against now is that we've made, for tens of thousands of years, uh, especially in the last 10,000 years, and especially since the Industrial Revolution, is we have created certain adaptations that are highly effective in pro pro protecting us from disease, from other predators, um, and from uh, you know the elements and so forth. But they have certain costs involved, and these uh, these are have become what I would call malignant maladaptations. Uh, they create a positive feedback loop uh, to make everything worse. Okay. Anything more, Mike, there? Um, yeah, that was really good. I have another question. I'll move on. Uh, government and good governance certainly must play a major role in bringing about the changes that need to occur to deal with climate change and the many other threats to the natural world that you talk about in the book. Leon Panetta, who has held many high-level positions in government, often says that either you govern through leadership or you govern through crisis. If you don't have good leadership willing to take on tough problems, then those problems won't be dealt with until some crisis forces action. 
It seems to me this concept explains a lot about where we are today on dealing with the problems discussed in your book. Leadership has been lacking, so crisis is now upon us in many areas, including climate change, overpopulation, and destruction of the natural world. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I agree with you. I think that um, um, clearly, um, at least uh, certainly in our, our democratic system, there are conflicting, conflicting views about things. Here we have, uh, and then let's talk about some specific, the Biden administration uh, putting in some very important controls on emissions and um, environmental protections. And uh, the Republicans coming along say, well, we want to cancel all that. And if you don't do what we say, we'll, we'll uh, let the, the, the government default on its debts, which will precipitate it, uh, uh, an international crisis. And so it's kind of a hostage situation. And uh, we've had these disagreements forever. Uh, the, the ideas that we should protect the environment uh, have been coming along for a long time. Um, you know, Plato complained about the deforestation of the islands in the, um, in the uh, GNC 2,000 years ago. Um, von Humboldt talked about this in the end of the 18th century in Colombia and his writings, and um, we've had uh, innumerable brilliant scientists in the 20th century and now the 21st century who have pointed all these things out. By the way, a guy named Bill Ruderman is a good friend of mine, and I think you may know his work from your work in meteorology. But uh, anyway, I think that the, 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 we have, uh, we have a, a big segment of the population, the United States, for example, that is fundamentally opposed to scientific knowledge about the world. They reject factual reality and prefer belief systems over the factual real well they how do you resolve that i mean you have uh political leaders uh uh like trump for example who is pandering to that group and um and there are others in that group that that make it impossible or almost impossible to have rational policies to deal with the, with the climate crisis um uh, Jimmy Carter installed solar uh, panels on the White House roof. Ronald Reagan took them down. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Barack Obama uh, helped support the the Paris Climate Treaty, um, and Trump uh, pulled out of it. And then, uh, you know, Joe Biden is uh, trying to put it back, and John Kerry is working there to work with that same group. So this this goes back and forth. Um, you know, I, I worked in family planning over 50 years ago with the federal government, uh, to help provide family planning to women who are poor women across the country, and that has been a political controversy and, and political conflict, uh, you know, from the beginning. And uh, and one of the actions that Trump was to reinforce the gag rule to prevent uh, family planning programs all over the world because his Trump his his base demanded that. So. Uh, I, I find these the, with some very specific details to illustrate what you're talking about, and uh, sometimes it's pretty difficult to be optimistic about going forward with these things. Since you brought up reproductive rights, I did have a question regarding uh, your thoughts on now we have a Supreme Court who are actively creating a theocracy, establishing Christian rule in yes, America. Yes, yes. They believe the uh, apocalypse is coming, and why worry about the breakdown of the climate? Because yeah. it's all part of God's plan. Right. Have you given any thought to the powerful evangelical movement in this country and their impact um, on climate I've, change? I, I look at the tips of their guns out my front window oh, of my dear. office for the last 50 years. <laughs> oh my! They, I'm on all the hit lists. Five of my medical colleagues have been assassinated along with a half a dozen other people oh, working my. in reproductive health care. So I know a lot about that. The, uh, the, the, the fact that the Supreme Court now is a wholly owned and operated establishment of the Republican Party serving the radical Christian right is no accident. They've been working on that since uh, before Roe versus Wade. And I think that the clear plan has been to, uh, to take control of the federal judiciary so that no matter what laws are passed at the local level, uh, it's going to reinforce a repressive and authoritarian approach to government. And uh, the book I'm reading right now is a particularly spectacularly good book uh, called the, the, the Lie That Binds is by Elise Hogue, who is uh, the former uh, president of, plan, of Narrow Pro-Choice America. Anyway, so the, we have now a, a, a radical 
uh, Dominionist, uh, white Christian nationalist movement in this country, uh, which controls the Republican Party, and uh, which has, and which, and that's not an accident. That was by design, and which wants a apt to establish a fascist theocracy in the United States, and they control the Supreme Court right now. That's the result of elections. I mean, people voted for these the 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 presidents, the Republican presidents, who installed this authoritarian. Uh, majority in the U.S. Supreme Court. Well, I am certainly sorry to hear about uh, your friends and what you've gone through. I didn't yeah. know that when I wrote yeah. the question. It is yeah. absolutely terrifying what they are doing um, yeah. and probably has had a big impact on my next question, which is yeah. my understanding that none of the IPP, IPCC member countries, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change yeah. member countries, have met their goals in the 25 years the group's been right. meeting. Right. And also, this past February, this year, a report from the University of Hamburg concluded that keeping warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius is, quote, currently not plausible. Correct. And the scientists have called it, quote, the world has blown its shot at keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Yeah. In other words, yeah. our world's climate goal is slipping away. We might yeah. have a chance to achieve the less ambitious target of 2 degrees centigrade, but even though, Celsius, I mean, but even that would require countries like the U.S. doubling down on efforts to cut carbon pollution and put right. them in motion yesterday. What do you think our future will look like at 2 degrees Celsius? And, and uh, any other thoughts about the IPCC? Well, I think the IPC is a, a, an incredibly important activity, and I have a number of friends who participated in that. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a critically important uh, function. Many scientists feel that the conclusions have been way too conservative, uh, but that reflects the conflicts in the scientific community and also the political atmosphere. Uh, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm personally acquainted with a lot of the people working on this and, uh, and, 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 and people who have been a brilliant scientists working on this uh, problem for decades. And, um, you know, I'm not a, a climate scientist, but, I mean, I can look around and I can tell you that from what I can see, we will pass uh, two degrees centigrade long before the end of this century. The glaciers will be gone. There will be no ice in the Arctic. Uh, the, um, some of the major glaciers in Antarctica are melting and slipping into the ocean. And that means uh, sea level rise. Uh, that means changes in the ocean circulation, uh, the, what they call the uh, Atlantic uh, overturning circulation uh, that keeps the climate stable in Europe, the United States, and a lot of other places. And so um, uh, we, we, and as Mike said at the beginning, you know, we're stripping, uh, we're strip mining the ocean of its contents, uh, and that's been a, a major source of nutrition uh, for humanity for uh, thousands of years. And now we're at eight billion people. It's going to be tough to feed all those people. And I think that we're uh, we're really devastating the climate. So I think that um, I, what I've seen, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think that we expect to pass 1.5 centigrade before 2050, if not much sooner than that. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, an ecologist named Tom Lovejoy, who uh, recently died, unfortunately, quite a brilliant man, um, pointed out that in his things he wrote that that uh, 1.5 degrees centigrade is going to be a major instability in climate ecosystems. Well, um, I also read somewhere that we're spo the, supposed to lose all the fish in the sea by 2048 from a combination yeah. of overfishing and yeah. the uh, lack of oxygen in certain areas and just right. the heating. Right. Time for a break. Right. You're listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM, Many Voices, One Station. Listen globally online from the KSQD.org website. My guest co-host today is Mike Clancy, chair of the Monterey County chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby, and we are speaking with our bold guest, Dr. Warren Hearn, who is a practicing physician, public health official, and doctor of epidemiology, and author of Homo Acophagus. A Deep Diagnosis to Save the Earth. We will be right back after Jim Hightower's commentary titled, What's Wrong with Us? What's wrong with us? Her nation's moral compass, I mean. I don't like being a downer, just focusing on wrongs, but some wrongs stand out as morally abominable, such as this one. 
It's about hundreds of thousands of our low-income elders who, toward the end of life, when frail and most vulnerable, find themselves cast into a part of the Medicaid system that has been deliberately structured by Congress to subject them to needless deprivations and daily indignities. These are our loved ones with serious health problems who need long-term care in nursing homes, and two-thirds of them rely on Medicaid to cover their costs. To get this benefit, they surrender all of their income, which goes to defray their nursing home expenses. Of course, for a decent existence beyond mere survival, we all rely on a few little things that are basic to our humanity. So Medicare authorizes each state to set a monthly, quote, personal needs allowance so their elderly patients can cover their hygiene and grooming products, a book or CD, a small gift for grandchildren, a chocolate bar, etc. Good, but then Mr. Menji walked in. In 1987, Congress set the minimum for this allowance at a meager $30 a month, under $8 a week. Congress has not raised it in the 36 years since, and most states still provide only a pittance, despite inflation and monopoly price gouging on practically everything. So our state and national leaders, who freely dole out massive corporate subsidies and tax giveaways to billionaires are leaving ill seniors with so little spending money that they must ration their toothpaste and scrimp pennies to buy a rare treat from the vending machine. This is Jim Hightower saying, I know this is small in the global scale of human indignities, but that makes it an even bigger moral failure for our society. It would take so little to do so much for so many. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is made possible by you subscribers to Jim Hightower's Lowdown on Substack. Find us at jimhightower.substack.com. We're back. My guest co-host Mike Clancy and I are interviewing Dr. Warren Hearn, author of Homo Ecophagus, A Deep Diagnosis to Save the Earth. Mike, you have a question. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly review the um, goals of the Paris Climate Accord for our listeners. Uh, the, the, The Paris Accord said we need to hold global warming by the end of this century, to well below 2 degrees centigrade to avoid dangerous tipping points. And we'd really like to hold it to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Well, we're not going to achieve that, unfortunately. If the countries of the world carry through with the pledges they have made to further cut greenhouse gases currently, then the models indicate that global warming will be held to about 3 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial. I personally think uh, we can do better than this. Um, as the increasingly severe effects of climate change become more and more apparent and countries double down on efforts to reduce emissions. So my optimistic prediction, and a lot of my colleagues consider this overly optimistic, my optimistic prediction for the end of the century is 2.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial. But the impacts of even my optimistic prediction are not good at this, as this takes us well into the realm of these dangerous tipping points that would trigger devastating changes in the Earth system that could not be reversed for many centuries to millennia. That being the case, how do you feel about the various geoengineering proposals that have been put forth for countering global warming? In particular, what's your view on stratospheric aerosol injection, the lofting of tens of millions of tons of aerosols into the stratosphere to reflect solar radiation back out into space and thereby cool the Earth? Dr. Hearn. Well, uh, thank you for uh, helping me understand that better. I've heard about some of these these uh, projects, they sound very dangerous to me and produce irreversible, uncontrollable changes that could be fatal. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, uh, convinced that any of these things are good ideas. I remember the uh, words of Eric Severide, who was a great TV journalist and a print journalist before that, who was famous for saying the chief cause of problems is solutions. Huh, and, uh, and, and uh, this is another example of a maladaptation that could uh, have very dangerous consequences. I think there are a lot of things that we're doing we need to stop doing. We need to use stop using fossil fuel for energy and for raising food and a lot of other things. Uh, and we need to stop uh, uh, over-exploiting uh, the oceans and the other aspects of the environment. There are many, there are many things that we could, we need to stop doing and change what we're doing. Um, I think that uh, another thing, frankly, is that as long as the human population is is growing. There is no hope of solving these problems. There is no hope at all. Uh, I, I, I agree with you that the things we could do, and I think that your, 
your idea that we will uh, we will, might be able to change below this keep this below 2.5 centigrade is is very uh, hopeful uh, and and uh, very positive, but I'm not at all convinced we can do that. And I think that we're already seeing major changes in the global atmosphere uh, and uh, climate that are are having catastrophic effects. We're getting, uh, as, as you know, as a meteorologist, uh, the more global warming we have, the more the ocean is warm, the more we have uh, uh, catastrophic weather events, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, and droughts. And, and these are already having severe consequences. Um, I think that um, um, I think we are in a desperate situation. Uh, the um, you know it's like the, the the Amazon rainforest is the largest natural rainforest on the planet. It produces a very large proportion of the Earth's oxygen. Um, the, the, the effort in the last. 50 years alone has been to destroy the Amazon, most recently under the presidency of uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, who is sort of their Brazilian equivalent of Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, Bolsonaro has been very was dedicated to really cutting down the Amazon as fast as possible. There are many of the, the, the climate scientists and, and the ecologists that work in that area are saying that we're getting close to tipping point with the, with the Amazon, where it will not be able to sustain itself as it has for millions of years and will turn into a steppe and savanna uh, that is no longer... Um, uh, absorbing carbon dioxide and produce it, but it'll be producing it. And, uh, and so there's a, there's a one of an example that would be an incredible uh, loss to uh, the the global ecosystem and to humanity itself. Um, I, I all I can say is, if you can convince people to to change the way we're doing things, uh, then hallelujah, I'm I'm all in favor of that. Uh, I think that. Uh, uh, it, it seems to me that our political institution are having a lot of trouble coming to grips with basic issues. Well, you mentioned hope, and, may, and maybe there's really no hope at all if we continue our population growth, but you talked about hope, and there was a study printed recently in Science Direct, and it, and, um, it talked about a, a cautionary note about messages of hope. It goes against what one of my favorite quotes of Dr. Stephen Covey, which which is, don't take someone's hope away. It may be all they have. But in this science, uh, this study they did, they, they focus on progress in reducing carbon emission, weakens mitigation motivation. What they mean is, is that if you give people messages of hope, it reduces or weakens their, their um Activism weakens them. They, they they become more apathetic. Basically, giving people hope equals inaction, and that pessimistic messages avoids complacency. Uh, this is conflicting for me because I always thought we need to give people hope to keep to not reach apathy. But then this this uh, study um, documented the opposite. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I, look, this is a conundrum. This is a, <laughs> a problem, a dilemma where we, if we are really candid about what we know in the scientific terms about what's happening to the planet and to our ecosystems and human population, it's very difficult to be optimistic. And I don't want to take away people's hope. Um, I've been a positive and optimistic uh, person my whole life, and I continue to be, um, and, I'm, and I think that... Uh, uh, we have to try to do what we can in spite of uh, some pretty ominous news. Um, but I think that uh, we have to be clear about uh, what the circumstances are. You know, and uh, people have been ringing the alarm bells about this for a long time. Decades. Uh, yeah, and, and, and yet we, it's, 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 it's very difficult for, for, for me to see how uh, even a functioning democracy can uh, take its policies at, at, to a point where we really are making the, the changes that, that need to be made. Uh, and, and this is even more difficult for authoritarian societies. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, one of the things I say in my book is that the, difference, the main difference between us and a cancer is that we can think and we can decide not to be a cancer. Um, you know, whether that's too true at the societal level is another issue. Yeah, along those lines, Dr. Hearn, um, climate change and indeed all of the issues facing humanity discussed in your book are global problems, which require a global solution. Yeah. 
And that necess- necessitates global coordination and cooperation, usually done under the auspices of the United Nations. This globalist approach, if you will, is anathema to many on the far right end of the political yeah, spectrum. exactly right. But I think it is absolutely an approach we must embrace to deal effectively with these issues. Uh, it sounds like you agree with that. And, and well, I do agree. That being the uh, case, how, how do we achieve the necessary global coordination and cooperation, given the current political state of our country and the world? Well, I mean, one of my basic answers is that we need to win elections. It matters who's running the place. And uh, we, we see a stark contrast in the last three or four uh, U.S. administrations in terms of approach to public policy of all kinds, uh, particularly in terms of uh, the environment. And uh, I think that um, uh, the so this is a matter of knocking on doors and winning elections, and uh, it's pretty down to that level. And this is at the, starting at the local level, and it matters who's uh, who has power. And uh, and I think that um, I, I really don't think there's any hope of convincing the white uh, Christian evangelical nationalists, for example, uh, of the, the the importance of scientific facts and uh, and the importance of listening to the consequences of what the scientists are saying. Uh, these are people who have grown up from the very early waking moments to believe the most preposterous nonsense and to reject facts about the world. So, I mean, I think that that's an important part of, a, of, the, of our, our national culture of at least third um, to, of, of the population. Uh, there are many people out there, millions of people, who believe that the Earth is flat, and that the Earth was created in seven days, and we got along with the dinosaurs, or something like that. I mean, I I, I think that we're up against religious fanaticism, and uh, the political solution is to win elections and to to try to uh, to have enough uh, political power uh, on the side of uh, facts and truth and science to be able to carry the day uh, on things like um, climate change. Uh, we you know now we have. You know, because of the last election, uh, presidential election, John Kerry's now back working on the the the, the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, he was he was he, his previous work under Obama was finished was terminated by Trump. So I mean, this is this is how it goes, and uh, and we have look. Uh, I'm a physician. And my my main professional work is helping women uh, control their fertility and to and to have safe abortion services. And we now have a Supreme Court that was installed uh, under the Trump administration that's rolling us back not just to the 19th, but maybe the 14th century. And, I mean, Alito quoted somebody from the 17th century in his his opinion about the Dobbs decision. And and he quoted somebody else from 1080, I think. I'd have to look at it. But, but, you know, it's medieval thinking. And I think that... um, uh, all I can say is that that uh, that these decisions are made by people in, with power. They get there through elections, at least in our society, uh, to the extent we can have them. And uh, we also have a, a political party that's against democracy and against uh, fair elections. So that's a that's a, a collateral struggle, which is very grim. Well, it's time to take a break, but after uh, the break, Dr. Hearn, I had a question, and then I know Mike has another. If you are just joining us, Michael Clancy and I are speaking with our bold guest, Dr. Warren Hearn. Dr. Hearn is a physician, anthropologist, public health expert, and a doctor of epidemiology, and who is also the author of the new book, Homo Ecophagus, A Deep Diagnosis to Save the Earth. You are listening to Be Bold America on KSQD 90.7 FM, Many Voices one station. I'm your host, Jill Cody. Stay tuned into KSQD this evening at 6 p.m. for State of Mind, hosted by Santa Cruz licensed psychotherapist Deborah Sloss. Artistic expression of any kind can help us process emotions and create a profoundly healing process. Many experiences, including trauma, can be difficult to articulate in words, and nonverbal expression can help improve mental health and well-being. Deborah's guests are psychotherapist Mary Welshmeyer, artist and cancer survivor Lisa Hanley, and child care professional and abuse survivor Elena Stanger. They discuss how the creative process has catalyzed their healing and supported ongoing mental wellness. That's State of Mind this evening at 6 here on KSQD 90.7 FM and KSQD.org. 
We're back. And Dr. Hearn, uh, the question that I wanted to ask is about, yeah. um, well, back in uh, 2007, I was personally trained by Al Gore. And one oh, yeah, of the, you mentioned that in your article. That's great. Yes. Oh, well, Good for you. Amazing man. I wish uh, he, sh- he showed himself, uh, you know, his real self in his presidential campaign because he's quite intelligent, quite funny. Um, but he did mention back then about concerns of the Gulf Stream collapse. And about a year ago, the scientists were spotting uh, warning signs of the Gulf Gulf Stream collapse, you know, that a shutdown would have devastating global impacts and must not be allowed to happen. And I know, you know, people say you shouldn't be an alarmist, but I want to be an alarmist to get people... this is an alarming situation. This is an alarming situation. It's completely appropriate to be alarmed about this. Yes, and so the research found that um, there's an almost complete loss of stability over the last century in our yeah, in yeah. our Gulf Stream, yes. and it's already at the lowest point in at least at least sixteen hundred years. Yeah. What would be the impact of losing the Gulf Stream? Well, I think that uh, Mike could uh, be, be your expert uh, witness on that particular question. But my impression. Uh, as a non-meteorologist or climate scientist, is that it would have a, a catastrophic effect on agriculture as well as other survival issues around the world. Uh, and I think that, um, um, you know, it seems to me what I remember is that the last time this happened was during the Pleistocene, and it produced a little ice age and the younger dryas, but the, um, the, uh, the, the Atlantic overturning circulation would be disrupted and this means that it would have uh, severe effects in the United States and Europe and Asia and other places and, and probably have a catastrophic effect on food production, which comes at a time when we have 8 billion people and counting. Uh, and that, that uh, th- th- this is going to have unbelievable um, catastrophe, uh, catastrophic effects around the world. So I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, what can we do about it? Well, we're already poised to have the melting of the polar ice caps and the Greenland uh, ice cap and uh, uh, the, the dumping of a lot of cold, fresh water into the North Atlantic, which is going to be a major contributor to that. And it, 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 it's, it's hard to see how we can keep that from happening under the circumstances. Yeah, I'll follow up on that a little bit. Uh, what's been happening, of course, as you know, Dr. Hearn, is the um, fresh water runoff from Greenland because of global warming is mixing in with the uh, warm, salty water of the Gulf Stream and preventing it, pre- preventing right. it from sinking. And yeah. that's causing the AMOC, the, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, to weaken. Yeah. And in fact, the Gulf Stream has weakened about 15% um, oh dear. since um, we started making direct measurements of the Gulf Stream back in the 50s, and it continues yeah. to weaken. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, it might take 100 years for it to completely yeah. collapse. But it did collapse uh, at the end of the last ice age, the end Eemian period. There is evidence that the, um, the AMOC shut down and the Gulf Stream collapsed. Right. And that led to a tremendously uh, stormy period in the uh, mid-latitudes, particularly in Europe. And it would be devastating to agriculture, just like you yeah. said. There's no doubt right. about that. Right. Um, if I have another question, if you don't mind, John. Yes, go um, ahead. Yeah, one of the disturbing political trends of recent years has been the rise of authoritarian leaders around the world and the decline yeah. of democracies. And you've mentioned yeah. this already a couple of times. Mm-hmm. And indeed, there are many who believe that even democracy in the United States is under serious threat. Yes. As you is. know, in fact, as you mentioned, the previous president of Brazil, mm-hmm. Bolsonaro, Yep. made it a high-priority policy to essentially destroy the Amazon rainforest to achieve right. some level of economic growth. Right. Is this the kind of thing we can expect from other authoritarian leaders around the world? Uh, how, absolutely. How, how yeah. do you think uh, authoritarianism, yes. authoritarianism will impact our ability to deal with the threats facing civilization discussed in your book? Well, I'd say extraordinarily difficult to impossible. I mean, I think that, uh, you, know, you know, we're not dealing with reasonable people almost by definition. And, uh, you know, what, what Bolsonaro did was an international crime against the planet and the earth and humanity. Uh, but to tell you the truth, that stuff has been going on in the Amazon for a very long time, uh, mostly during the last century and uh, in recent years. Uh, so, uh, but I think that, um, you know, supposedly Brazil has a democratic government. My dear friends in Brazil think that it's uh, getting some pretty rotten results, although Lula is better than Bolsonaro. But I think that, um, 
I, I think that uh, um, the, the, I, all, what, all I can say is that I, I, I want us to, to try to, to help the leaders of, of any country, whatever their attitude is, to understand the existential crisis we're in with climate change, the fact that uh, whatever they're planning to do is going to go down the tube uh, if the climate crashes uh, the way that many of us think that it's going to and that they need to listen to what the scientists are saying, including in their own countries, uh, and, and to, to try to change their policies. I mean, that's about the best I can do with that. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I wish I could say, uh, yeah, they have the power to make change, unilateral changes for the better, uh, that doesn't seem to be the pattern. You know? Well, we have to stop electing psychopaths because a psychopath. What a good idea! Because <laughs> I mean, psycho- we, yeah. we have a president who's raised, raised uh, violent sociopathy to the level of search, social, social, civic virtue. I mean, <laughs> that's right. I mean, they yeah. they don't have any compassion, no, humility, no. or empathy, yeah. and that's yeah. what it takes yeah. to right. to fight uh, the climate yeah. crisis. And authoritarian societies are yeah. corrupt societies. They're just yeah. uh, a few yeah. gets all the money channeled to them. So yeah. mm-hmm. uh, fighting for our democracy Democratic countries is 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 ultimately well, uh, gives us a chance to solve our climate yeah, uh, I'm, I'm breakdown. Back to my, yeah, I'm back to my sort of uh, other original, uh, uh, not not particularly uh, original idea was winning elections for people who are reasonable. Yes, and and I think that every single election is. Our lives are on the line. Well, that's we also know that psychopaths find each other, and I have yeah. a feeling that basically that's what the Republican Party is now. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, that we, you know, I'm an epidemiologist. I would like to look at the epidemiology of sociopathy. I think mm-hmm. it's taken over the Republican Party. But, I mean, I really think at the root of that is the, the white Christian evangelicals, they're running the Republican yes. Party. That, that's, that's really, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, a fascist Christian theocracy here, and, and that's that's what they want. That's what they're fighting for. Yeah, so, right. Dr. Hearn, um, d- regarding everything that we've talked about and, yeah. uh, and your key points in your book, what can we keep doing, stop doing, and start doing as they relate to the topic of your book? I know voting, uh, but do you have more for us? I mean, our future depends on it. Yes. Uh, oh. All I can say, Jill, is I think, first of all, I, mean, I commend you on your excellent program. This is, I've done a number of these programs. This is certainly one of the best, if not the best, because you really ask excellent questions and let me answer the question. Why, thank you. Can. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is really, you're doing a superb job, and this is very important public, edu- public education. So I think I would strongly support what you are doing, and this is really critical, and helping people understand they, they have to go out and be active in the community. You have to, you know, be, be involved the political process. They can't stand by and let somebody else do it. That, that our lives depend, futures depend on it. And so I think that, uh, uh, but, but, you know, getting people to be involved in the political process uh, and, 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 and win and to put reasonable people into office is absolutely critical. I mean, how about the contrast between our current president of the United States, who's a reasonable, normal, compassionate person, and the previous psychopath? I mean, it's the starkest contrast in American history. And I think that, um, uh, you know, Trump uh, won the election by 77,000 votes in three states. And <clears throat> there were a lot of factors in, the, in that. But I think that uh, the, 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 the white Christian evangelicals, the anti-abortion people, cared more about winning the election than everybody else. I think that's basically a long short of it. And voter suppression. That's right. I mean, the, 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 the gerrymandering in North Carolina and Wisconsin and a few other places makes it impossible for people to really express their views. And I think that um, we have to have uh, reform and the, the, uh, these, the electoral districts uh, and the stop the gender gerrymandering. And uh, there are many uh, details of this that are, are critical, um, but it's all about um, uh, finding people who will run for political office and win, who will support democratic values and science and, and reasonable solution to public problems. Well, I think one thing is just everybody needs to keep in mind that when they're voting, to ask about their position on the climate breakdown, because yeah. this is uh, existential. Yeah. And in yeah. the last uh, minute... Mike, did you have any uh, wrap-up thoughts that you wanted to say? Yeah, just that, uh, Dr. Hearn, what a tremendous honor it's been to uh, 
be able to talk with you today. You know, I've over the course of my career, I've come across a lot of and, and had interacted with a lot of very brilliant people, but I put you number one on the list here. Oh, thank you very your, much. Your career and the things you've done yeah. have just been extraordinary, and yeah. um, it's been an honor to speak with you, sir. It has been. Well, I, I put one foot in front of every day, every, in front of the other every day, and trying to keep plugging along here. Keep you know? it going. So do we. Yeah. You just keep yeah. going. There's no alternative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we have That's to right. keep fighting. Right. Well, yeah. Dr. Hearn, thank you yeah. for being our bold and impressive interview yeah. guest. Yeah. You, yeah. you have had a brilliant com- yeah. career. Well, Thank you very much. You're very kind. And you wrote a brilliant book, yeah. and uh, it can be found where all fine books are sold. Am I right? Well, I think that the Routledge is the uh, press is the uh, publisher, and they have websites where you can order this. <clears throat> I think it's available through other outlets uh, <clears throat> such as Amazon.com, and I even saw Walmart advertising it. So I'm encouraged oh, by that. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for yeah. joining us on Be yeah. Bold America today. Thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Hearn. This hour flew by. Yes. Well, I think we could talk for hours about this stuff. I think we Good. can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. What's next on Be Bold America? Please join us on Sunday, May 21st, when we will be discussing Better to Win, Hardball Lessons in Leadership, Influence, and the Craft of Politics. For this program, we'll be interviewing Bill Wong, who is an award-winning political strategist about his new book, Better to Win, that examines the mindset and machinery involved in the use of power and the sacrifices necessary to affect meaningful change for those who don't yet have a voice in the halls of power. Bill Wong shares impactful skills and strategies for change agents and powerful stories of Asian Americans who played and continue to play an important role at the table where decisions are made. Find out more about not fooling yourself into thinking you can do much good or defeat evil without power by joining Be Bold America on Sunday, May 21st at 5 p.m. for Better to Win, Hardball Lessons in Leadership, Influence and the Craft of Politics. As a reminder, Be Bold America is available as a podcast. Now you may listen to the show anytime for free by subscribing through your favorite podcast platform, such as Apple, Google, and Spotify. I want to give a special thank you to Be Bold's America program engineer, Eliza James, and our station's program director, Howard Feldstein, and to my guest co-host, Michael Clancy, frequent lecturer on the climate crisis and who currently serves as chair of the Monterey County chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for inviting me, Joe. You're listening to KSQD Santa Cruz, Many Voices, One Station. Listen worldwide online at ksqd.org. Stay tuned for State of Mind with Deborah Sloss. My name is Jill Cody, and thank you for listening to Be Bold America. Until next time, keep, stop, start, 